सी आई ई टी एन सी ई आर टी प्रेजेंट्स ऑडियो बुक ऑफ हिस्ट्री फॉर क्लास सेवेंथ इन टाइटल्ड आर पास टू दिस इज द चैप्टर नंबर फाइव टाइटल्ड रूलर्स एंड बिल्डिंग्स फ्रॉम पेज नंबर सिक्सटी टू पेज नंबर सेवेंटी फोर Let's listen to the chapter 5 Rulers and Buildings page number 60 Figure 1 shows the first balcony of the Qutb Minar Qutbuddin Aibak had this constructed around 1199 Notice the pattern created under the balcony by the small arches and geometrical designs Can you see two bands of inscriptions under the balcony? These are in Arabic. Notice that the surface of the minar is curved and angular. Placing an inscription on such a surface required great precision. Only the most skilled craftsperson could perform this task. Remember that very few buildings were made of stone or brick 800 years ago. what would have been the impact of a building like the qutb minar on observers in the 13th century figure 1 the qutb minar is 5 stories high the band of inscriptions you see are under its first balcony the first floor was constructed by qutbuddin aibak and the rest by iltutmish around 1229 Over the years it was damaged by lightning and earthquakes and repaired by Alauddin Khalji, Muhammad Tughlaq, Firoz Shah Tughlaq and Ibrahim Lodi. Between the 8th and the 18th centuries kings and their officers built two kinds of structures. The first were forts, palaces, garden residences and tombs. Safe protected and grandiose places of rest in this world and the next the second were structures meant for public activity including temples mosques tanks wells caravanserais and bazaars kings were expected to care for their subjects and by making structures for their use and comfort rulers hoped to win their praise Construction activity was also carried out by others including merchants they built temples mosques and wells however domestic architecture large mansions or havelis of merchants has survived only from the 18th century engineering skills and construction monuments provide an insight into the technologies used for construction taking something like a roof for an example we can make this by placing wooden beams or a slab of stone across four walls but the task becomes difficult if we want to make a large room with an elaborate superstructure this requires more sophisticated skills between the 7th and the 10th centuries architects started adding more rooms doors and windows to buildings roofs doors and windows were still made by placing a horizontal beam across two vertical columns a style of architecture called trabeate or corbelled between the 8th and the 13th centuries the trabeate style was used in the construction of temples mosques tombs and in buildings attached to large stepped wells or bawlis on the bottom of this page two pictures are shown figure 2a screen in the qawwat al islam mosque delhi late 12th century figure 2b corbelled technique used in the construction of the screen on the top of this page some important information is shared written in a box labor for the agra fort built by akbar the agra fort required 2000 stone cutters 2000 cement and lime makers and 8000 laborers on the right hand middle of this page 
some very important information is shared regarding bowries. Rani ji ki bowry or the queen's step well located in Bundi in Rajasthan is the largest among the 50 step wells that were built to meet the need for water. Known for its architectural beauty, the Bauri was constructed in 1699 CE by Rani Nathavatji, the queen of Raja Aniruddha Singh of Bundi. Page 62 Temple construction in the early 11th century Figure 3a the Kandarya Mahadev Temple dedicated to Shiva was constructed in 999 by the King Dhangadev of the Chandela dynasty. Figure 3b is the plan of the temple. An ornamented gateway led to an entrance and the main hall, Mahamandap, where dances were performed. The image of the chief deity was kept in the main shrine or Garbhagriha. This was the place for ritual worship where only the king, his immediate family and priests gathered. The Khajuraho complex contained royal temples where commoners were not allowed entry. The temples were decorated with elaborately carved sculptures. Figure 4 the Raj Rajeshwar temple at Tanjavur had the tallest shikhar amongst temples of its time. Constructing it was not easy because there were no cranes in those days and the 90-ton stone for the top of the shikhar was too heavy to lift manually. So the architects built an inclined path to the top of the temple, placed the boulder on rollers and rolled it all the way to the top. The path started more than four kilometers away so that it would not be too steep. This was dismantled after the temple was constructed, but the residents of the area remembered the experience of the construction of the temple for a long time. Even now, a village near the temple is called Charupallam, the village of the incline. On the left-hand bottom of this page, a question is being asked, written in a blue box. What differences do you notice between the shikhar of the two temples? Can you make out that the shikhar of Raj Rajeshwar temple is twice as high as that of the Kandariya Mahadev? Two technological and stylistic developments are noticeable from the 12th century. One, the weight of the superstructure above the doors and windows was sometimes carried by arches. This architectural form was called arcuate. Compare figures 2a and 2b with figures 5a and 5b. Figure 5a A true arc, the keystone at the center of the arc transferred the weight of the superstructure to the base of the arc. Figure 5b True arc Detail From the Alai Darwaza, early 14th century, Kuvvate Al-Islam Mosque, Delhi 2. Limestone cement was increasingly used in construction. This was very high quality cement, which, when mixed with stone chips, hardened into concrete. This made construction of large structures easier and faster. Take a look at the construction site in figure 6. A painting from the Akbar Nama, dated 1590 to 1595, showing the construction of the water gate at the Agra Fort. On this page, a question is being asked, written in a blue box. Describe what the labourers are doing, the tools shown and the means of carrying stones. Building temples, mosques and tanks. Temples and mosques were beautifully constructed because they were places of worship. They were also meant to demonstrate the power 
wealth and devotion of the patron. Take the example of the Raj Rajeshwara temple. An inscription mentions that it was built by King Raja Raj Dev for the worship of his god Raj Rajeshwaram. Notice how the names of the ruler and the god are very similar. The king took the god's name because it was auspicious and he wanted to appear like a god. Through the rituals of worship in the temple, one god, Raja Rajdev, honoured another, Raj Rajeshwaram. Page 64 On the top left of this page, an important information is given in a pink box. A royal architect. The Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan's chronicler declared that the ruler was the architect of the workshop of empire and religion. On the bottom of this page, a picture of a mosque is shown. Figure 7 Plan of the Jami Masjid built by Shah Jahan in his new capital at Shah Jahanabad between 1650 to 1656. The largest temples were all constructed by kings. The other, lesser deities in the temple were gods and goddesses of the allies and subordinates of the ruler. The temple was a miniature model of the world ruled by the king and his allies. As they worshipped their deities together in the royal temples, it seemed as if they brought the just rule of the gods on earth. Muslim sultans and padshahs did not claim to be incarnations of God, but Persian code chronicles described the sultan as the shadow of God. An inscription in the Quwwat al-Islam mosque explained that God chose Alauddin as a king because he had the qualities of Moses and Solomon, the great lawgivers of the past. The greatest lawgiver and architect was God himself. He created the world out of chaos and introduced order and symmetry. Page 65 As each new dynasty came to power, kings wanted to emphasize their moral right to be rulers. Constructing places of worship provided rulers with the chance to proclaim their close relationship with God. Especially important in an age of rapid political change. Rulers also offered patronage to the learned and pious and tried to transform their capitals and cities into great cultural centers that brought fame to their rule and their realm. On the right hand top of this page, an important information is given regarding water. Importance of water The Persian terms Abad, populated, prosperous and Abadi, flourishing, are both derived from the word Ab, meaning water. It was widely believed that the rule of a just king would be an age of plenty when the heavens would not withhold rain. At the same time, making precious water available by constructing tanks and reservoirs was highly praised. Sultan Iltutmish won universal respect for constructing a large reservoir just outside dehli e kuhna It was called the Hose Sultani or the King's Reservoir. Can you find it on map 1 in chapter 3? Rulers often constructed tanks and reservoirs, big and small, for use by ordinary people. Sometimes these tanks and reservoirs were part of a temple, mosque. Note the small tank in the Jami Masjid in figure 7, or a Gurudwara, a place of worship and congregation for 6, figure 8. In the middle of this page, on the right-hand side, a picture is shown. This is Harmandar Sahib, or Golden Temple, with the Holy Sarovar, or Tank, in Amritsar. Why were temples targeted? Because 
kings built temples to demonstrate their devotion to God and their power and wealth. It is not surprising that when they attacked one another's kingdoms, they often targeted these buildings. In the early 9th century, when the Pandyan king, Srimar Sri Vallabh, invaded Sri Lanka and defeated King Sain I, 1831-1851, the Buddhist monk and chronicler Dhammakitti noted, He removed all the valuables, the statue of the Buddha made entirely of gold in the jewel palace, and the golden images in the various monasteries, all these he seized. The blow to the pride of the Sinhalese ruler had to be avenged, and the next Sinhalese ruler, Sain II, ordered his general to invade Madurai, the capital of the Pandyas. The Buddhist chronicler noted that the expedition made a special effort to find and restore the gold statue of the Buddha. Similarly, in the early 11th century, when the Chola king Rajendra I built a Shiva temple in his capital, he filled it with prized statues seized from defeated rulers. An incomplete list included a sun pedestal from the Chalukyas, a Ganesha statue and several statues of Durga, a Nandi statue from the eastern Chalukyas, an image of Bhairav, a form of Shiv, and Bhairavi from the Kalingas of Orissa, and a Kali statue from the Pals of Bengal. Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni was a contemporary of Rajendra I. During his campaigns in the subcontinent, he attacked the temples and defeated kings and looted their wealth and idols. Sultan Mahmud was not a very important ruler at that time, but by destroying temples, especially the one at Somnath, he tried to win credit as a great hero of Islam. In the political culture of the Middle Ages, most rulers displayed their political might and military success by attacking and looting the places of worship of defeated rulers. A question is being asked, written, in a blue box. In what ways do you think the policies of Rajendra I and Mahmud of Ghazni were a product of their times? How were the actions of the two rulers different? On the left-hand side of this page, figure 9 is shown. Mughal Char Baghs A. The Char Bagh in Humayun's tomb in Delhi, 1562-1571 b. Terraced Char Bagh at Shalimar Gardens, Kashmir, 1620-1634 c. The Char Bagh adapted as a riverfront garden at Lal Mahal Bari, 1637 Gardens, tombs and forts Under the Mughals, architecture became more complex. Babar, Humayun, Akbar, Jahangir and especially Shah Jahan were personally interested in literature, art and architecture. In his autobiography, Babur described his interest in planning and laying out formal gardens, placed within rectangular walled enclosures and divided into four quarters by artificial channels. Page 67 These gardens were called Char Bagh four gardens because of their symmetrical division into quarters. Beginning with Akbar, some of the most beautiful char bags were constructed by Jahangir and Shah Jahan in Kashmir, Agra and Delhi. See figure 9. On the right-hand side of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 10. A 1590 painting of Babur supervising workers laying out a char bagh in Kabul. Note how the intersecting channels on the path create the characteristic char bagh design. On the bottom of this page, another picture is shown. Figure 11 Tomb of Humayun constructed between 1562 and 1571 Can you see the water channels?
there were several important architectural innovations during Akbar's reign. For inspiration, Akbar's architects turned to the tombs of his Central Asian ancestor, Tamur. The central towering dome and the tall gateway, Pishtak, became important aspects of Mughal architecture. First visible in Humayun's tomb, the tomb was placed in the centre of a huge formal char bagh and built in the tradition known as Eight Paradises or Hasht Bihisht, a central hall surrounded by eight rooms. The building was constructed with red sandstone etched with white marble. On the top of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 12 The throne balcony in the Divane Arm in Delhi, completed in 1648. It was during Shah Jahan's reign that the different elements of Mughal architecture were fused together in a grand harmonious synthesis. His reign witnessed a huge amount of construction activity, especially in Agra and Delhi. The ceremonial halls of public and private audience, Divane Khas Oam, were carefully planned. Placed within a large courtyard, these courts were also described as Chihil Sutun or Forty Pillared Halls. Shah Jahan's audience hall was specially constructed to resemble a mosque. The pedestal on which his throne was placed was frequently described as the Qibla, the direction faced by Muslims at prayer. Since everybody faced that direction when court was in session, the idea of the king as a representative of God on earth was suggested by these architectural features. The connection between royal justice and the imperial court was emphasized by Shah Jahan in his newly constructed court in the Red Fort at Delhi. Page 69 Behind the emperor's throne were a series of Pitra Dura inlays that depicted the legendary Greek god Orpheus playing the lute. It was believed that Orpheus's music could calm ferocious beasts until they coexisted together peaceably. The construction of Shah Jahan's audience hall aimed to communicate that the king's justice would treat the high and the low as equals, creating a world where all could live together in harmony. In the early years of his reign, Shah Jahan's capital was at Agra, a city where the nobility had constructed their homes on the banks of the river Yamuna. These were set in the midst of formal gardens constructed in the Char Bagh format. The Char Bagh garden also had a variation that historians describe as the riverfront garden. In this, the dwelling was not located in the middle of the Char Bagh, but at its edge close to the bank of the river. Shah Jahan adapted the riverfront garden in the layout of the Taj Mahal, the grandest architectural accomplishment of his reign. Here the white marble mausoleum was placed on a terrace by the edge of the river and the garden was to its south. On the right-hand top of this page, an important information is given. Pitra Dura, coloured hard stones placed in depressions carved into marble or sandstone, creating beautiful ornate patterns. On the bottom of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 13 The Taj Mahal at Agra, completed in 1643. Shah Jahan adapted the riverfront garden in the layout of the Taj Mahal the grandest architectural accomplishment of his reign. Here, the white marble mausoleum was placed on a terrace by the edge of the river and the garden was to its south. Page 70 Figure 14 A reconstruction from a map of the riverfront garden city of Agra. 
Note how the garden palaces of the nobles are placed on both banks of the Yamuna. The Taj Mahal is on the left. Compare the layout of Agra with Shah Jahanabad in Delhi in figure 15. On the bottom of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 15 this is 1850 map of Shah Jahanabad. Where is the emperor's residence? The city appears to be very crowded. But did you notice the many large gardens as well? Can you find the main street and the Jami Masjid? Page 71 Shah Jahan developed this architectural form as a means to control the access that nobles had to the river. In the new city of Shah Jahanabad that he constructed in Delhi, the imperial palace commanded the river front. Only specially favoured nobles like his eldest son Dara Shikoho were given access to the river. All others had to construct their homes in the city away from the river Yamuna. Regions and Empire As construction activity increased between the 8th and 18th centuries, there was also a considerable sharing of ideas across regions. The traditions of one region were adopted by another. In Vijayanagar, for example, the elephant stables of the rulers were strongly influenced by the style of architecture found in the adjoining sultanates of Bijapur and Golconda. See Chapter 6. In Vrindavan, near Mathura, temples were constructed in architectural styles that were very similar to the Mughal palaces in Fatehpur Sikri. In the middle of this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 16, interior of temple of Govind Deva in Vrindavan, 1590. This temple was constructed out of red sandstone. Notice the two out of four intersecting arches that made the high ceiling roof. This style of architecture is from northeast Iran. Khurasan, and was used in Fatehpur Sikri. The creation of large empires that brought different regions under their rule helped in this cross-fertilization of artistic forms and architectural styles. Mughal rulers were particularly skilled in adapting regional architectural styles in the construction of their own buildings. In Bengal, for example, the local rulers had developed a roof that was designed to resemble a thatched hut. The Mughals liked this Bangla dome. See figure 11 and 12 in chapter 9. So much that they used it in their architecture. The impact of other regions was also evident. In Akbar's capital at Fatehpur Sikri, many of the buildings showed the influence of the architectural styles of Gujarat and Malwa. Even though the authority of the Mughal rulers waned in 18th century, the architectural styles developed under their patronage were constantly used and adapted by other rulers whenever they tried to establish their own kingdoms. On the left-hand side of this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 17. Decorated pillars and struts holding the extension of the roof in Jodhbai Palace in Fatehpur Sikri. These follow architectural traditions of the Gujarat region. On the bottom of this page, the picture of a church is shown. Churches that touched the skies. From the 12th century onwards, attempts began in France to build churches that were taller and lighter than earlier buildings. This architectural style, known as Gothic, was distinguished by high pointed arches. The use of stained glass, 
often painted with scenes drawn from the Bible and flying buttresses. Tall spires and bell towers which were visible from a distance were added to the church. One of the best known examples of this architectural style is the Church of Notre Dame in Paris, which was constructed through several decades in the 12th and 13th centuries. A question is being asked in this blue box. Look at the illustrations and try and identify the bell towers. Page 73 Imagine, you are an artisan standing on a tiny wooden platform held together by bamboo and rope 50 meters above the ground. You have to place an inscription under the first balcony of the Qutub Minar. How would you do this? Let's recall. 1. How is the Trabiat principle of architecture different from the arcuate. 2. What is a shikhar? 3. What is a pitar dura? 4. What are the elements of a Mughal char bagh garden? Let's understand. 5. How did a temple communicate the importance of a king? 6. An inscription in Shah Jahan's Diwan e Khas in Delhi stated, If there is a paradise on earth, it is here, it is here, it is here. How was this image created? 7. How did the Mughal code suggest that everyone, the rich and the poor, the powerful and the weak, received justice equally from the emperor? 8. What role did the Yamuna play in the layout of the new Mughal city at Shah Jahanabad? Key words Go through the chapter and make your own list of six key words. For each of these, write a sentence indicating why you chose the word. Page 74 Let's discuss 9. The rich and powerful construct large houses today. In what ways were the constructions of kings and their courtiers different in the past? 10. Look at figure 4. How could that building be constructed faster today? Let's do. 11. Find out whether there's a statue or a memorial to a great person in your village or town. Why was it placed there? What purpose does it serve? 12. Visit and describe any park or garden in your neighborhood. In what ways is it similar to or different from the gardens of the Mughals? The chapter 5 of total 10 chapters of the book ends here. Narrator Babla Kochard You were just listening to this audio book. Technical Control, Bati Langlingdo. Technical Assistance, Vikas Sangwan. Assistance in Production, Kusum Lata. Direction and Production, Vimalesh Chaudhary. This audiobook is brought to you by CIET and CERT, New Delhi, India.